This Zero Now program is brought to you with the support of our founding partners. Following the mass tragic shooting at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas on May 24, 2022, the U.S. Department of Justice conducted a detailed critical incident review to learn from the event and to prevent future tragedies. We invite you to join us for this critical conversation featuring special guest Nesmia Comrie, Mark Lomax, and Sheriff John Mina from the COPS Critical Incident Review Team in our conversation, EOJ Special Report, Rob Elementary Debrief. I'm, I'm really looking forward to introducing our special, very special panelists and guests today from the, um, the Critical Incident Review Team uh, from the uh, DOJ's COPS office. Uh, the first person I want to introduce is uh, Nazmia Comrie. Welcome, Nazmia. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. And Nazmia, would you mind just giving us a brief background and your, your connection with this project and, and how you got involved? Absolutely. So I'm a sociologist here at the COPS office, the Office of Community Oriented Policing Services. I've been here for the last 13 plus years, um, working in a wide variety of different areas, including training and technical assistance for state, local, tribal, territorial, and campus law enforcement agencies. Um, in particular for this, I was the co-manager for the critical incident review at the, at, of the active shooter that occurred at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Florida excuse me, Uvalde, Texas. So um, I'm really looking forward to the conversation today um, and really just uh, spending some time with you all and your entire community. Great, thanks, Nazmi. I'm glad you could join us. Speaking of Florida, uh, Sheriff uh, John Mina, thank you for joining us, uh, John. And, and Sheriff, would you mind giving us just a brief background and your connection to this project? Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is John Mina. I'm the sheriff here in Orange County, Florida. I've been the sheriff for going on six years. Prior to that, I was with the Orlando Police Department for about 28 years. And uh, my last four years there, I was the chief of police um, and was chief during the, the Pulse nightclub tragedy. Uh, because of that, some of my other experiences, I was um, like Mark chosen to be one of the subject matter experts for this critical incident review of the, the tragedy in Uvalde. Thanks, John. We're glad that you're part of this program today. And Mark Lomax, welcome back to uh, Conversations. We're glad you could join us, Mark. Uh, would you mind just giving us a quick background on, on yourself and your connection with this project? Yes, and thank you. And thank you again for um, bringing me back, um, Zero Now. And uh, welcome um, to the whole community. Um, my name is Mark Lomax. I spent 27 years with the Pennsylvania State Police. I retired as the Director of Training and Education. Spent some time with the IACP as training manager. Spent some time over in Liberia, West Africa, working for the United Nations. And then I was the Executive Director for the National Tactical Officer Association. Um, for the last several years, I've been doing consultant work. Currently, I'm the um, Director of Campus Safety at George School. And um, and right, what you're seeing today, it's, it's just part of the, the, the a large team. Uh, there were 10 um, subject matter experts and two of the, the managers, um, NASMIA being one. And so I was um, fortunate enough to, to be part of this, this, this team. And um, we, it was a lot of work. So I'm glad to be here. And, and we're so excited that you, you're all here because I know this is the, really the first time we're able to have a conversation about this. And I know a lot of people are going to have questions. And, and if you do have questions, if you're a participant, hit the Q&A button. Uh, we'll take the questions during the program. We have a number of questions that came in during registration that, we'll, um, that we will address as well. And, uh, but to start, really, Nesmi, if you wouldn't mind just giving us an overview of what this whole review process looked like from start to, to, to finish. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, you know, before I go over the review, I just want to say, you know, our hearts are with the community in Uvalde and all those who have been impacted in Uvalde as well as across the country. Um, and that was a driving force for all of us um, throughout this entire process. Um, but the way we were able to get this um, is initially the former uh, mayor in Uvalde reached out to the U.S. Department of Justice and asked for an independent review of the law enforcement response to the incident that occurred. And as a result of that, the COPS office, um, one of the Department of Justice components, was asked to lead, um, and as Mark said, a team of subject matter experts, um, really that covered a wide variety of different areas of expertise. So we had experts from emergency management, active shooter response, incident command, trauma, 
uh, victim and family support, public communications, officer safety, wellness, and school safety. Um, this, uh, we then launched that work. Um, as Mark mentioned, it was a lot of work. Um, and our scope was really wide in the sense we were looking at pre-incident planning, response, looking at post-incident actions, as well as the entire incident itself. Um, and I want to be clear, this was not an investigation, criminal or administrative. This was a review. To date, this has been the most comprehensive completed. Um, and our goals were threefold. Um, we really wanted to ensure we are providing an authoritative counting of what occurred that day, as well as the days leading up to it and the days following that. We wanted to identify lessons learned for the entire field on terms of how to improve future preparation for and responses to mass shootings. And of course, um, and the top of our mind was to help honor the victims and the survivors of Rob Elementary School. So uh, we collected and reviewed over 14,000 pieces of data and documentation, ranging from policies, videos, images, um, interviews, uh, training documents, investigative material. Uh, we were in Uvalde nine times over 54 days, and we conducted over 260 direct interviews um, with individuals from more than 30 different organizations and agencies, really with the goal for us to, to be able to pull together um, this report and to ensure that all of our information was cross-verified um, and as accurate as possible. In addition to that, we also traveled around the country to understand what is kind of contemporary active shooter training um, so that we can make sure that as we are uh, really drafting our recommendations that we were able to pull from generally accepted practices. So again, really we are keeping accuracy in the forefront, but also balancing transparency and trauma informed approaches. And that's how we ended up with the report that we publicly released back in January. That's great. Thank you, Nesmi. And you, you mentioned, you know, looking at things before the incident happened. Um, John, was there anything that, that really jumped out as far as a preventative uh, concern or things that could have happened before any sort of red flags or, or concerns that led up to the incident that you identified? Well, as from the law enforcement perspective, uh, there definitely was a lack of pre-planning, coordination, and training uh, for a, a multi-agency response. Anytime uh, you have a mass shooting, especially at a school, uh, no matter how what the size of the community the agency is, there's always going to be a, a multi-agency response. And because of that, uh, agencies within that area need to train uh, together and and that didn't happen in this case and uh you know th and this takes it takes years of practice and planning and coordination uh between all of the, the state local and federal agencies and, and many communities do this uh, very successfully uh, but that's what it that's what it takes um to help uh, mitigate uh, when this type of tragedy occurs and mark we you know we always talk about this in, in zero now the, the question who owns your school safety program? And so who owned the safety responsibility and the, and the operationalization of school safety at, at, the, at the school district? Well, U Uvalde was unique in that it had its, it's an independent school district and it had its own police department um, that was stood up a few years prior. Um, so they, they owned it as far as um, preparation, um, um, equipment or whatever, it was their responsibility um, to do that. And getting back to um, um, what John was talking about also, there was a lack of, um, and it's in the report, a lack of preparation on the school um, part, um, the, the school system and also the school police that were in charge of security of the uh, facilities. Was there anything about the school district that put it at higher risk compared to other districts? I mean, one of the, obviously one of the challenges that that we that we that we face on an ongoing basis is the the perception that you know nothing bad could ever happen to our district because we're we're a safe community. Nazmi, was there anything particularly? Uh, um, uh, risky uh, or a higher risk profile of that particular community? That's a, that's a great question. So um, there was, you know, there are these uh, events that are called bailouts um, that we've heard a lot about. Um, and what these bailouts are traditionally, because um, they're so close to the border in Uvalde, um, between the, the U.S. and Mexico border. And um, what would typically occur with a bailout is that there would be some sort of chase across the border. So somebody would be trying to flee from a border crossing and they'd be chased by 
uh, Customs and Border Protection, or they'd be chased by Texas CPS or the locals. And so this was something that we were hearing about um, when we started to conduct our work, is that initially when a lot of the calls were occurring and the lockdown occurred, there was this thought that there might be a bailout that was occurring um, because of the way that the, the city is kind of connected and how close the school was. Um, but through our analysis, we were really able to find that there um, although a lot of people were talking about the numbers of bailouts, we really weren't able to track down these like daily or weekly bailouts. We were able to track though that these were occurring and that might have led to this kind of complacency that we were able to see between the school and the city and that kind of the government officials. Um, but that is, I think, kind of the closest piece that I would say to that. Um, another thing that I would also just uh, quickly add regarding what Mark and John were saying from a preparedness perspective is, um, not only is the the importance of coordination and training, but I think it's also the importance of understanding the policies and procedures in place. And so one of the things that we saw is that, you know, the local municipality agencies were not very familiar with these lockdown procedures that were occurring at the school. And so, you know, while they're they're responding, they're seeing the lights off and they're hear they're not hearing noise coming from the classrooms. And there was this assumption that that meant that there was nobody in those classrooms. And so one thing we talked about in the report is the importance of understanding any of those responding agencies, understanding what are those protocols that are occurring within the school so that when they come on, on scene, they understand that this is part of their lockdown procedures, but then they're also familiar with maybe the layout, they're familiar with how they can access keys, maps, that type of thing. So I think that's also really tied in with what uh, Mark and John were both saying about pre preparation. If you wouldn't mind, before I said we obviously want to, we want to dive into some of the the lessons learned and and, and advice from that, but just from the the human element, I mean, Mark, how was the experience with, with you know is from a mental health perspective? Because obviously you probably were exposed to a lot of 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 footage that might be obviously traumatic. Um, how would how did how did you experience? How did you go through that whole process? Um, yeah, that's a great question, and and one of the things that was. Um, paramount when we started this and thanks to the department of justice um, for looking at this um, very tragic situation and preparing for it and that um, we had um, dr april natural who was a a um, trauma stress um, specialist and um um uh, forgot who else was on there but they they um, were um, provided us not only um, instructions and foundations and formatting how to do um, in interviews and how to interact with the, the victims and how to even um, write the report, but also you know ensuring that we were taken care of. Um, like Nasmia said, there was thousands of hours of you know video and hundreds of hours of video and 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 document documents we had to review and photos and um, visiting the sites and also the interactions with the families which was um, as you can only imagine very tragic um, so I don't think anyone on the team is is the same before um, this um, this report uh, I think it affected each and every one of us um, a lot um, but Again, because of the support that we had um, internally uh, from the Department of Justice, ensuring that um, we were taken care of, and it's long term, you know, that you know we need to ensure that you know we take care of each other, and and um, for the long term, because being exposed um, to the, the tragedy that was there compares nothing to the actual families that have to deal with that forever in the actual community. But as um, the reviewers doing this review, it was very um, traumatic, so. Thanks, Mark. I, I'm, I'm, I'm certain as cannot imagine. And, and John, I mean, um, you know, Mark mentioned uh, in, in interacting with families. What what type of uh, interaction did you have as part of this review process with, with uh, local law enforcement and, and their uh, perspectives on the response. Yeah, so as as Mia said in the beginning, I, you know, we did almost 300 interviews, uh, many of those uh, with law enforcement, and and it was, of course, it was it was tough on them as well. And um, you know, in like Mark had mentioned, you know, talking with uh, 
your teachers and parents and, and medical personnel and community members. Um, it really gave us a sense of, of what happened, how they felt about it, uh, what what services uh, they were getting or weren't getting and what they needed. Uh, but yeah, it was it was tough hearing from um, the people who were right there um, who saw uh, that tragedy. Uh, it really was. So I, I'm I'm glad as well. We had you know services in place for not only the team but um, you know, for the for the community as well. And Nesmi, have you been through an, uh, any sort of review of this type of uh, a mass uh, shooting event? I mean, is this is this some, is this new to you specifically, or have you have you been through this before? So I've um, I've worked uh, with teams on um, after action reports um, and reviews similar to this, but I will say that this has been our most comprehensive and our broadest um, and really uh, a very different role than I think we've traditionally had in the past from the cops office. Um, in the past, we've worked with a vendor or an organization to um, conduct that review jointly. And in this case, this was a Department of Justice led review report and review and we worked directly with the subject matter experts but in the end this was a, a report that was released by the attorney general of the united states um so that came along with the very different roles and responsibilities um uh, as a co-manager of this and a uh, very different role and responsibility when it came to drafting the report um so uh, i don't think you know i think i had that experience in the past but i don't think anything could have uh, prepared if that makes sense for for this type of work no, no, it certainly does. And Mark, uh, I mean, was there any, what was most surprising to you uh, when conducting this review? Did anything really jump out that really uh, stood out as, as, as surprising during your process? I think just the enormity of the tragedy, um, that something that we were probably never seen uh, in our generations, um, that, you know, um, just a tragedy of 19 little uh, ones being killed and two adults. And so it, it was unique in, in that regard that um, the waiting of 77 minutes um, in order to um, save the little ones that were alive and to stop the, um, the shooting and the killing. So I, I think um, this um, tragedy um, was unique in that it was an abject failure as far as how the police responded um, based upon what was going on. And so that that made it made it very um, different and unique and um, very tragic. So, John, um, uh, I'm sorry, Nesmi, yeah, did you have a comment? I just wanted to add to that, um, just that I think when uh, with the work that we were doing in Uvalde, I think I just want to quickly highlight the shared trauma um, we're talking about such a small community and it's very law enforcement. It's a very law enforcement kind of heavy community. And so uh, one of the things is that you had first responders that were also parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles of those that were in that hallway or sisters or brothers. And so I think that was that was something that, we, you know, traditionally when we've seen in a larger city that there could be a little bit of that distance, but you had paramedics that were treating their own children, right? And so I think that when we're talking also long-term and a lot of the work, um, it was really important for us with our work to really focus in on trauma and support services. And that was one of the reasons is that we were seeing so many layers around that, that um, in particular what they experienced, but then also that long-term um, kind of piece. I mean, and then also the fact that all seventh, second to fourth graders that were in public school were in that school. Um, and so talking about kind of the generational trauma, we had some that had 23 cousins that were in that school. I think that is an important piece when we're talking about what occurred there and the kind of the trauma and the long-term impact. Well, that, you know, that that's obviously very interesting and, and uh, you know, that's surprising. Um, so one of the questions that I, I do have, John, um, um, so going back to the the you you mentioned that the the uh, the local law enforcement was the the safety uh, the official, if you will, for the for the school district. Um, when 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 you have that type of arrangement, I think someone asked a question in the in the in the Q and A here about this as well. Um, are there are, are are there proactive measures such as prevention programs, behavior threat threat assessment teams? Um, multi-layered security approaches that are implemented in, in, a, in a district when it's in, when it's operated by um, the local law enforcement department, if that is the, the actual ownership of the school safety programs. 
So I think um, each community is different and, and they have to decide what's best for them. And, and certainly uh, any type of threat mitigation system uh, or any any technology that, that can be used uh, for school safety uh, is is invaluable. And so who, I, whoever owns it, whether it's the, the school district or or law enforcement or in, in a lot of cases, it's the law enforcement and school safety working together. Um, that's, that's simply put, they have to work together to see what the best systems are for uh, for their school and use the, use the best practices um, that, that many are using around the country in, in, you know, in those different protocols when, when a threat comes into a school, okay, what happens? Um, what's what's the follow up? Um, who's 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 being notified? And uh, in, in many jurisdictions, it's it's everyone together. Uh, if if a student makes a concerning statement or a threat, uh, you know, the school's notified, the parents are notified, law enforcement's notified, you know, a counselor's notified, so that everyone can kind of work together to see if this is um, a legitimate threat. Or, or this was uh, a, just a child uh, who, who made a joke. We have that a lot, and it's obviously not funny, but that does happen uh, many times uh, in many jurisdictions around the country. So uh, to me, it's just everyone has to work um, together. It can't be just one entity uh, on its own, and that's why there has to be um, you know, systems in place and 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 meetings and and policies and memorandums of understanding between all those different entities uh, to ensure that our, our community and especially our schools are safe. All right, uh, you have a comment, Mark? Yeah, one of one of uniqueness about um, Texas is that they have like over 1,200 um, school districts and about 300 have their own police department. So every, like John said, every, um, um, school district um, based upon the community will set up different um, uh, standards and practices. So on that note, John, I mean, what, what, what were you most surprised at from this review with regards to law enforcement, their protocols, response, uh, unified command, lack of, I mean, what, what, what were you most surprised at? Uh, so I think um, I, I was most surprised at the initial response um, was good in that the officers responded to the school within three minutes. Uh, they they determined there was a threat, a person with a gun on the school. They went to that threat, directly to that threat. They went to the sound of gunfire, uh, but then they stopped. Uh, to me, that was the most surprising thing with with all the tragedies that have happened around the country with with. Uh, you know, going way back to Columbine on forward, uh, the you know, the practices and the, the the training and the policies that everyone has that you know we have to stop the killing, uh, we have to stop the dying. Um, so that that was what was one of the things that was most surprising to me. Uh, the other part that was surprising to me was was the lack of leadership um, there. Um, after that uh, initial surge and then failure to to penetrate the classroom, um, but, you know, there was no leadership. Um, to make the, the decision uh, that we all know should have been made to to enter the classroom, stop the killing, and save those kids. Is that be because of a lack of policy, or is that how the system was established, John? I, I think it's uh, it's many things. It, it was it was a lack of the the, the perfect. The, a lot of policies. It was a lack of training. It was a lack of pre-planning. It was a lack of leadership. It was a lack of experience. And you know, from early on, what I saw from my experience was um, agencies that were ill-equipped to handle this type of thing because of all those things um, that were in place. The, the, the lack of leadership, the lack of, of training, um, and the lack of of pre-planning. Nesmio, what were the uh, and then the initial response. I mean, what were the different agencies that did respond initially, and and how did that play out? Yeah. So, uh, as John mentioned, within the first three minutes, you had a, a personnel from the Uvalde Police Department and the Uvalde Consolidated Independent School District Police Department. So, both the school district as well as the local municipality, um, all together, you had eleven officers respond again within three minutes of the shooter walking into the school. Um, active shooting was going on while those officers are there. Um, 
within minutes, you had officers showing up from uh, Customs and Border Protection. Uh, you had officers showing up from Uvalde County Sheriff's Office. And in the end, they had 24, um, 24 agencies represented. Um, close to 400 officers were there uh, uh, in the end based on that response. But the uh, UPD and UCIS CPD were the initial responders. So, John, I'm going to go back to you on this one. So in, in a situation where you have multiple agencies, who takes the leadership? Who takes ownership? The, 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 who's the quarterback of, the, of the, the entire incident response when it comes to the operation of a response? So it should be the jurisdiction who, who has authority in that jurisdiction, and that would have been uh, Uvalde Evolve the police. Now, in in some smaller jurisdictions, you know they may have to lean on um, some of their larger counterparts, whether that's state uh, or the county, which they can certainly, um, which which they can certainly do. But uh, in these cases, it is that jurisdiction who has the responsibility. And, and if they don't, they they need to ask for that for that help. And so, and that's why the incident command is, is so important and um, unfortunately was not set up right away because what should have happened is the, the leaders of all those agencies from uh, the police department to, to the school police to the sheriff's office to uh, the state uh, and even federal authorities who are responding um, should have set up a command post even quicker uh, but you know and that and that will help with with resources and um, you know there was no staging area there was no good inner or outer perimeter that was set up but but e but even beyond that you know you, we always say that you know the first the, the first officers on scene they, they have to be the leaders they're the ones that have to make the decision uh, you know when things um, start to slow down and, and decisions are made that's where you know uh, the formal leadership needs to step in and say, hey, <laughs> we need to go in there. And you know, that that wasn't done in this case. And hey Mark, what, what would you say a best practice is for that? Because I know for our participants, we have a number of school safety directors, superintendents, school administrators, school board directors. Should the, one of our members always talks about, you know, when when the time to prepare, when the time to respond uh happens, it's too late to prepare. So the question is. What is the best approach? What, in retrospect, what could have and should have happened um, as far as organizing the, the relationships between the different agencies, establishing that incident command, and establishing the, the clear uh, line of delineation as far as um, the response? Uh, what would you recommend in that case? Yeah, I mean, every every jurisdiction is going to be different, like John said. And in Uvalde, you know, you had to the school police, he had the local police, he had a county sheriff's department and, you know, state police coverage also. But, you know, with for our, our, our audience out there, you got to look at your own individual uh, municipality or governments or whatever. So there's two two components to um, this prep preparation. One is the first responders, you know, tabletop exercises and having a, a, um, um, a up to date um, emergency operations plan that everybody's on board with. So um, having um, MOUs um MOAs um amongst the, the 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 police departments that are probably going to respond to your institution is a good thing to be able to um bring those um entities together not only police but also fire EMS ambulance local hospitals um those types of stakeholders should be on the same bandwidth um, whether you come together once a year or, or more than that that's a that's a start the other part of this is the um, the government the the local leaders the elected leaders um they also need to be part of this um process because whenever there's a major event like this or a tragedy like this um there's going to be overlapping of jurisdictions not only police fire and ems but also resources um so the the, the mayors or the, the township supervisors or the city councils or whatever they also need to come together prior to um, any um, major event like this to occur because once it does um then it's kind of too too late if you do not know who to reach out to in your local municipality if you're elected leader and it comes all the way even down to 
budgets over time? Who's going to pay for this? You know, hotels, you know, um, can, can we have some of these resources? So um, it's, it should be a holistic approach to this pre-planning, not just police uh, or fire EMS, but also local governments, um, um, businesses, you know, who's going to supply coffee, who's going to give hotel rooms and stuff like that. So these are the things that need to be part of pre-planning. Um, it's not only just for um, tragedies like this, but it could be like for, you know, a 4th of July parade or something major that's going to be occurring that's going to involve uh, many different jurisdictions. So uh, again, you know, pre-planning, um, you, you, you can't, can't do that on the fly when something's going on. So pre-planning these types of things is a positive. Exactly. Get the tabletop at, at least, right? At least once a year. Uh, Nesmi, I just, just want to dive a little bit more into the, the assailant and were there, were there red flags uh, um, that, 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 that emerged? I mean, were there opportunities to provide some sort of early intervention to uh, disarm the situation before before the action actually uh, took place. And we always talk about, you know, how do we prevent an event from happening? And if we prevent an event from happening, how, how do we prevent harm, right? How do we mitigate the scope of harm so nobody gets hurt if we fail to prevent an event? Could the event, were there concerns that, that were raised before the actual event occurred that you that you learned during this review? Thank you for that question. So, um... In, for uh, this review, we did not look into red flags or the subject themselves. Um, but what I would say is that we did look into the processes um, because this was not an investigation. And so some of the areas that we saw was like threat assessment teams, the value of having a threat assessment team in place and what occurs when you don't have a threat assessment team that is really looking into things um, that are potentially concerning, um, that are potentially uh, what you know some people would kind of call as like red flags. Um, that was one area that we we saw. I think we also talked a lot about kind of the pre-planning piece. Um, but for us, it was really important for us to really look at processes and system failures, which is why uh, the decision was made for us not to do an analysis on that individual subject. So was, was there a threat assessment team in place? So on paper, there was supposed to be a threat assessment team. Um, but what we found through our analysis is that the threat assessment team was not to generally accepted practices and to those standards that would traditionally be a threat assessment team. Um, and so that was an area that we, we did find through our analysis and that we did end up detailing in the sense of recommendations in terms of really the way that an, a school district and a community as a whole should really be looking at that from a threat assessment perspective. Um, and so, so that was, that was one of the areas that we found that was a failure. And, you know, what's, what's unfortunate is, it, you know, this, this is probably more common than, than we can all imagine is that, um, you know, I've spoken to school administrators that really don't have that clear ownership. I always go back to ownership, like having a safety director, for example, that, you know, maybe at the beginning of the school year, they get together a, a safety team. They talk about the issues, uh, that they have in the, in the, in the, in the district, and then they'll 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 write some things down and they'll throw it on the shelf and then they'll revisit again next year. And that's that's a challenge. And and obviously, you know, school safety is, you know, it's always a priority, but the question is how do you operationalize that? And going back to the procedures, Mark, um, what what was there any sort of training, uh, a, a active shooter training, lockdown training uh that that uh Rob Elementary or the district conducted prior to this situation? Yeah, um they there are different um, levels of, of competency as far as those that were on the scene, especially the first um, couple minutes, as far as leadership, as far as their training, as far as active shooter training. Um, um, not all the, the leaders that were there had NIMS or uh, incident command training. Um, some of them had just went through an active shooter training. Um, just prior to the, the event. So there was a mishmash of, of different um, um, levels of, of um, education and training um, for those first responders. As far as the school itself, um, we, we really didn't find a robust uh, active shooter type of um, uh, training. As, um, as Mia stated, 
they were kind of used to these bailouts. And so there was a problem differentiating between um, when there's alert, whether there's a bailout or it was something tragic that occurred like what it just did. So um, there needs to be, if you're looking at your own schools and your own school districts and you, you have fire alarms and you have active shooter drills and you have shelter in place drills, um, there needs to be some differentiation. So, you know, you're not clumping it all into one type of emergency announcement that people may think it's something, but it's something else. Nesmia. I would I would also add, I think um, there were the lockdown procedures as Mark was uh, sharing, but I think one of the other things is that there wasn't enough um, awareness and education on what options that can occur during a lockdown. So um, the, the staff and the students were kind of trained, you go on a corner, you turn off the lights, you're stay quiet. Um, and really not thinking about the other aspects to a potential active shooter or an active assailant. Um, this also carried forward to uh, kids that were, and uh, teachers or gym teachers that were out on recess out of the school. They were only ever taught, you go into the classroom, you go into the corner. So they send kids in, they, sent, they ended up sending kids into the school where there's active fire going on because that those are that's the way that they're taught. And so one of the things we talked about in the report is really thinking about dynamic training and thinking about the different options that could be provided um, to staff and to um, and to students. I think the other thing is that there was also a lack of uh, standard operating procedures for the school district police department. And so you see that kind of carry forward in the sense of some of the school staff didn't even know that they had their own school district police department. Um, and so I think that was another area that um, was there. And then the final thing that I would say is that the communication, um, they were in the midst, uh, uh, you know, a couple months prior, they had changed over to the, the Raptor system. There was a lot of confusion when we were speaking to school, uh, school staff about whether the alert would have come through the PA system, would it come from the Raptor system? There was tech, uh, mobile uh, like Wi-Fi issues. So some people weren't getting their texts. And so that was another area that, um, I think is important for all of all the listeners today to think about uh, with your schools. John, so based on on, on, on that comment about uh, the communications and the technology, I mean, what what is there are any recommendations that come from that? You know, what technology to utilize? How to best utilize technology in a in a in a situation like this that you recommend? Yeah, so on that, and I, I tell our residents here all the time, both you know, me and Mark have been in this profession a long time, uh, and it's not just technology. It's it, To me, in my opinion, it's three things, right? It's uh, it's law enforcement or, or security and safety personnel, right? boots on the ground. Um, and it's, it's, it's the community and that means, you know, teachers and parents and everyone kind of looking out for each other. The third piece of that is the technology, right? Whether that's the gun detection systems, cameras, license plate readers, you know, gunshot detection system, you know, thermal imaging, facial recognition, it's all out there, you know, and we, we, we talk about the, the hardening of the schools, the single point access. And, um, you know, they're in my area, they're trying out these, um, uh, you know, pass through, uh, you know, gun detection uh, systems uh, as well. I, you know, it's un it's unfortunate that you know, we've come to that, but um, you know, I, I think we need to if we want to keep our kids safe. I think um, parents and administrators and, and teachers all would agree that you know we need to do whatever we need to to keep our kids safe. And and I think it takes all three of those, right? Law enforcement or and or security. Um, the, the community, and then all those different pieces that te technology that can be used to to keep a school safe and even prevent uh, a tragedy from happening. Well, that's exactly. I mean, technology. I, I mean, they're tools, right? They're tools for for humans to 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 do things that you can't do independently or as effectively without the use of technology. Just on that note, because so we have a lot, of, we have a lot of questions that that are coming in during the program, but we also have a lot of questions that came in uh, during registration and. Uh, just to remind folks, um, after this program is done, um, if you jump into the Zero Now community, if you go to zeronow.org, click on community, um, we'll have a we'll continue this Q and A um, online uh, on the community, and then the the replay of this will be available a week from today on there. But um, we'll continue to take your uh, questions. Um, but Mark, on, just on the note of technology, because somebody asked this in here uh, earlier today, um, was there any technologies that could have helped prevent this or? 
uh, any specific technology. I mean, we, I know we talk about communications technologies, um, but but you know, based on the review, um, would, would you would there would there be any technology recommendations that came out of this to be to be considered? Yeah, yeah. One of the um, glaring um, issues um, that really um, heightened this this situation was that all the exterior doors were unlocked and so um it's a it's an old older school and as most of those schools in the Uvalde school district are older ideally you know they had card access um, technologies on all the doors where you need a card reader card to get in and the doors were shut you know 24 7 that would have um, mitigated um some of this um they had cameras in the, in the hallway, as we all saw that. They had cameras on, on the outside that we were able to to see um, from um, the the funeral parlor and so forth. But um, the the like Nasmia said, the the Raptor system was kind of new um, to them, so they were trying to you know understand how that thing worked. But uh, I think you know. Um, um, like John said, you know, there's three components. There's, you know, um, boots on the ground. There's the community being everybody being aware that it's technology. But one of the, the glaring um, things that I noticed was that if they had um, electronic doors, um, that would have um, uh, mitigated um, a lot of that. So what were the, I mean, were the, the doors manual uh, analog Locks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And, and, you know, somebody, you know, a couple questions about, uh, about technology and, and you know, obviously you mentioned cameras and, you know, obviously John, you mentioned, you know, weapons detection, you've got the, you know, you've got visual weapons detection with using cameras, you've got uh, concealed weapons detection and you've got gunshot detection. Would any of those technologies had any sort of impact John, uh, based on your review? Um, how quickly he was in the school? Probably not, um, and that's why I go back to what Mark said. If you know, if we're if we're if we're able to keep people out, um, that will buy us time for those systems to take place. Uh, and you think about, and we also didn't mention you know, there's all kinds of. Uh, you know, the, the mobile panic alert systems that uh, you know, students and teachers have a direct access to on, on cell phones that can be used, um, but all the, but all that takes time. And when we either leave doors open or unlocked, um, you know, time quickly becomes our enemy, and you know things happen very very quickly. Uh, so in this case, I don't I don't think any of those systems um, would would have helped that quickly. Would you know the the officers were there within three minutes. Um, and, and, you know, I think um, if they went into the classroom right away, I uh, like the best practice of state and, and uh, you know, ended ended the, the killing. Um, that's that's what would have helped prevent it, uh, as many people from not dying. That's me. Yeah, I think in, in this uh, particular case, I think, I, you know, I just want to highlight the fact that their officers were there within the three minutes. I think, you know, that's an important piece. I think um, the the biggest failure we saw was the the consideration that this was a barricaded situation. Um, so you know that was you know they they as John mentioned they those you know the the officers that first got there which we call first on the scene in the report they ran towards the classroom and they were within feet of the classroom with active shooting. And after uh, two officers got grazed, um, they kind of immediately retreated and only one officer ended up going up twice after that. And then they immediately uh, transitioned to a barricaded situation. That was the failure there um, because they immediately went from treating this like an active shooter to a barricaded. Um, from a technology perspective, I think absolutely the access to the doors um, one thing that we heard repeatedly um, was that, you know, they didn't know that the doors were, you know, they didn't know how to access the doors. And so if there was a mechanism in place, whether that was a key card or some sort of tech piece of technology, whether it was a knockbox, whether there was some way for them to access that. Um, but just talking about the doors themselves, I just I want to kind of highlight the classroom doors had to be locked from the outside. So physically, a teacher would have to walk outside um, or, you know, kind of stick their, their arm out in order to lock the doors. Um, and so I, you know, I just give some context in terms of the doors that we're talking about. 
Um, and I just, I think it's important to think about, the, it just emphasize the the fact that they believe that this, in the end, they transition this to a barricaded situation. Wow, no kidding. Okay, I'm gonna take a couple questions from uh, registrants. So uh, Eric Shello asks, what are some common pitfalls you see school administrators falling into during active threat incidents? What role did, did school administration have in this in this incident? The principal, superintendent, there was no safety director, correct? You mentioned that it was, it was in the, um, the local PD. Um, who wants to take that question? Mark, you want to take that? Sure. Um... All the hard questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so there, there, there had a print. There, the principal was there, um, and also the superintendent um, was aware of everything. There, there was a a breakdown, um, and at that level also, as far as what to do, um, they relied primarily on the um, Uvalde um, um, unif um, school police chief to to um, be the leader of that situation. Um, so there was not much that was um, indicated that the the school leadership did. One thing that um, did come out was the um, the breakdown as far as communications was coming out of the the school district, whether it's social media or or press conferences, that a lot of um, misinformation was being sent out through their social media during this time when they were, when the incident first occurred, you know, their, the school district social media was saying, you know, there's a situation, but everything's fine. Once they knew that um, there was an active shooter, they still didn't come across um, heightening up the, the, the level of the concern. So as far as administrators were concerned, um, there was a breakdown in, in leadership and um, again, they didn't really contribute um, to the resolution as much, um, pro 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 probably um, contribute to the chaos. So Nesmi, just building on that, what, uh, what role did communications, official communications from the school to parents, to media, to the community have during the entire incident? That's a, that's a hard question. So um, within, uh, probably within, I think about five, six minutes, the first official communication went out from Uvalde Police Department. Um, and it kind of, it was a strong message. It was explaining, you know, what was kind of occurring, asking people to kind of stay out of the area. Um, the first communication from the school district uh, was 27 minutes after the incident occurred. Um, and that was a very difficult message that was sent out um, because it said that all the kids were in the classrooms and were safe. Um, and they they ended up using kind of stock language um, that they sent out. And so that I, that I was like the start of a lot of misinformation that was coming out. Um, at one point when they were talking about the reunification, the, the school district was sending out one location, then the police department was sending out another. And then they were kind of changing the location. So you had families going to different locations. You had families not knowing where their kids were in terms of, you know, which uh, location to go to. So there was a lot of miscommunication from the beginning. And part of our analysis was looking at the official communication from the start of the incident all the way to a year past um, to understand. And I would say that this official, from an official communication perspective, there was a lot of misinformation, lack of information, that occurred um, and it, it just added to the pain and the anger and the frustration from the families, the communities um, in terms of um, what information was accurate, how to follow through with that and um, you know who you could trust. And so that is a big area um, that has continued um, for that community. Thanks, Nazmia. Um, Carl asks, um, and, and John, I'll direct this to you, but to what extent do you believe that this report can apply to higher education? As far as lessons learned, oh yeah. So, you know, when, when I I've been involved in some after actions of my own, uh, I've read a lot of them, and this um, this critical instrument review um, really really serves as a blueprint uh, in my mind for uh, law enforcement for um, anyone in education, whether it be higher education or not, to to really look at um, the findings and recommendations and put, put those in place. Uh, if 
you know, I think if if many of those things had happened um, uh, beforehand, um, you know, certainly things could have uh, been different. But it's I think it's a great blueprint for anyone to use. And you know, from from early on of being involved in this project myself, I saw gaps in my own agency and like, hey, we, you know, we need to do this. Or you know, is our is our school district doing that? Let's let's find out if they're doing that. Um, is is the college doing that? Uh, let's find out if they are doing that and and what what exactly they're doing. Um, and that's that's why I think it's just such a great uh, comprehensive report for for everyone, for law enforcement, for uh, anyone in education, and for community and government as well as well as people who are who deal with uh, trauma uh, as additionally. And we do have a number of folks asking about the availability of the report. And okay, thanks, Mary, for posting that in there. We'll we'll have it we'll have it linked in uh, the Q and A in the community as well. After I know a lot of folks are interested in that. Um, Bob Muick asks, uh, uh, and this is this is directed to you, John. A law enforcement question. Um, uh, our leadership in law enforcement is often exempt from annual in service training. Uh, does this highlight the need for leadership to keep current on training? Uh, does it set them up to fail if they don't remain current? Absolutely. You know, um, everyone should be involved in training from uh, from from the newest person all the way on up. And um, if you don't know what your agency is being trained on, you know, how, how are you supposed to effect, effectively lead them on? And, you know, one of the things that that I did after after this incident do is make sure my agency is doing active shooter, active assailant training every single year. Uh, but certainly, um, you know, <laughs> training doesn't stop uh, after, you know, you, you, you rise to the ranks. You, you need to continuously train. You need to go to different areas of the country to train, I think. Uh, you can't be um, stuck in a silo and think you do it right in your area. Um, now, with that, you know, that, that comes with... Uh, costs and that's why you know it's the, the cops office is a good uh um avenue to approach uh, for that as well it, you know that you know um training costs money um you know there's personnel that need to, to be on the street but we also need to make sure that we're we're prepared so training is very important for for everyone in, in law enforcement thanks john um sarah asks and and asked me i'll direct this to you um uh, was it the official policy of Rob Elementary to send students back into the school for an active shooter situation? Was that was that documented? So there was a lot of lack of documentation. Um, that is that is uh, one of the biggest issues that we faced. Um, that was what they were trained on, and that was within our the training materials and. Um, the information that we were able to triple verify. Um, but in terms of actual written policy, um, there was a lot of things that were just not put into policy that um, we have flagged throughout the report. Got it. We have uh, about five minutes. And, and um, if if we I really would like to learn probably the, the, the biggest lesson that, that you, your biggest takeaway from this entire process. And Mark, I'll, I'll start with you. I mean, what, what would you say that Biggest takeaway, if you had to leave our, our participants with one final thought regarding this, what would you leave them with? Um, I would say get a, if you're a school or university or hospital or whatever, um, get a, a, um, uh, an analysis or assessment done um, by a third party to, to come in to review your safety and security um, um, policies, procedures. If you are just sitting on your laurels and saying, hey, we got this great thing going on, then you're missing out. They have a third party, different eyes come in and tell you, well, these are the glaring things. If that was done in Evalde, <laughs> those things that we were just mentioning would have came to, you know, came up. So I think the biggest thing to take away is have somebody come in, do an assessment of your facility and find out where your, your vulnerabilities are. Um, that, that great advice, Mark. And, uh, and, and this is very important for school administrators now because uh, we talk about technology and, and vendors and, and, you know, everyone's knocking the door this technology will solve all of your problems, right? Until you know what your vulnerabilities are for your specific school district, your specific campus, 
how in God's name are you going to know what you actually need? And we talked about that before, John, right? The technologies are just tools to help you be more effective and more efficient. But if you don't understand your vulnerabilities, then how are you going to know what type of training that you need, what type of technology you need? Looking at the doors, right? The the, the door locking mechanisms, all of those factors are, are, are just overlooked because you're not starting from the very beginning, having the ownership, like who owns safety in your district? Number two, what are your vulnerabilities? And from the from that assessment of vulnerabilities and the right leadership, then you can move forward with the next steps and implementing things. So I'm a big fan of your response, Mark. Uh, Nazmia, what, what would you say your, your biggest, uh, aside from that, of course, uh, your biggest uh, um, um, insight from this whole process was that you would share with our administrators? Yeah, I mean, I think that if if you're not preparing and planning now and thinking that it's not going to happen, um, you're you're already behind. Um, every community, every agency, every law has to be planning for this and thinking about this in a multi jurisdictional, multi um, agency approach. That that has to be the solution. You can't be doing this in a silo. So I would just say, um, if there's anything you take away from this, I strongly encourage every single one of you to be planning and preparing. Um, because unfortunately it's way too common. It may not be your school, but it could be your supermarket. It could be a, a faith-based organization. It could, you know, it could be a park. Um, you have to be planning for this because um, it's just, it's all too common. That's great. Thanks, Nesmi. Yeah, it, it is. And, and that we talked about earlier that never here, this will never happen here. This is a safe community. And that that's probably one of the biggest obstacles actually to, to moving things forward is, and you know, then when it never happens here, that's when you have your annual safety meeting and you throw the plans on the shelf and move on as it always was. So great insights, Nasmia. And John, your, your final primary takeaways that, that your takeaway that you would share with our participants. You know, and I'll direct this uh, towards our law enforcement community. You know, we're, we're going to be the ones that go there. This is a dangerous job. Uh, we all take an oath. Um, we all have to risk our lives, especially for our children. And so that's what's expected. That's what's expected um, from the parents out there. That's what I expect as a parent when my child was in school. So um, for, for leaders, we have to make sure that our law enforcement personnel have the training. They're going to be the first ones there. Technology, locked doors, not everything's going to stop it. Uh, if someone wants to get in, they're going to get in. Um, so we need to make sure that that we are prepared uh, to end the threat as quickly as possible. Great. Thanks, John. Really appreciate that. And uh, so we, we are completely out of time. But like as I mentioned, is no surprise, there's more questions that we have time to answer. So I just want to encourage everyone to go to the uh, online community. We'll, we'll continue to answer the questions. Want to thank John. Sheriff Mina, thank you very much. Mark Lomax and Nazmina, th th thank you so much for joining us. A very, very insightful. Stay safe, everybody. Take care.